Have you ever used a pipe bomb or other consumable as part of your build? I think most people will probably say no and vow for these being underpowered. I know I for sure never bothered to use them. So I decided to try and beat an apocalypse campaign with only consumables. And well, it turned out that these are a lot more powerful than I originally thought. And in fact, compared to my Firestorm only run, they kind of made the campaign a breeze. So this is my pay to win build and had a consumable only apocalypse and remnant too. The first major component of the build is, well, the consumables. There are plenty of guides over farming scrap, but my go-to was running the Red Throne loop until I'd stockpiled around 900 consumables. Part of the successiveness was just for testing builds, since I tried out a lot of equipment until I got a setup that performed particularly well. Ahane Crystal and Shadow of Misery give pretty decent buffs, but the Red Ring of Death, Timekeeper's Jewel, and Detonation Trigger really make this build pop. Detonation trigger will make the impact damage of consumables be significantly higher, but even better is it makes three of our four consumables cause burning damage on top of their normal statuses. Black tar on its own is pretty pitiful otherwise, but being able to self-ignite makes it a good option, and seeing the brightstone ignite is pretty hilarious. But unfortunately, the binding orb doesn't benefit from it. Timekeeper's Jewel extends our status durations, and with a single pipe bomb, that lets me get a full 18,000 damage. This gives a great option for low budget runs where you're tired of farming scrap. By chucking pipe bombs and black tar, I was able to manage a DPS of roughly 1000, and since it's also applying dot and duplicating it via the red ring of death, this makes it a pretty potent build. Effectively, this gives us two playstyles depending on how your wallet's feeling. But what really ties this build together is the Ritualist Archetype's prime perk, Vile. The infected buff from it is nice, but the other effect is what we really want. If we kill an enemy that's under a status effect, those statuses will spread to all enemies within 15 meters. This makes killing mobs actually quite easy, since the pipe bomb applies good bleeding and burning. Medic might seem weird as a second archetype, but it gives a nice 25% damage boost, and the 5% crit chance applies to the explosion damage from the pipe bombs. So, let's take this build into an apocalypse campaign and see if we can consumable only Remnant 2. My first world was Yesha, specifically the Ravager variant. For the big spenders out there, clearing the overworld comes down to just chucking pipe bombs. But for those without hordes of scrap, there's another option. Personally, I never used the sneaking mechanic in this game before this run, but it's a great way to save some scrap, and it's a lot easier to get by enemies than I thought it would be. And even better, since this is a scrap saver strategy, we can run up to the next crystal if we get caught, and then go down to prevent losing any consumables. For me, I ran into the Root Nexus, and knowing this thing had a chunk of health, I thought I'd try to conserve my bombs, but this was really biting me with the adds. While I didn't opt for going Rambo, I did opt to restack fire on the Nexus anytime the fire status ran out. This thing just had too much health, and they say time is money, so I ditched my money saver strat. As for dealing with the adds, it's important to either target the big adds or not directly hit the little rolly guys. The rollers die before getting status, so the status is only spread by targeting the other adds. It's essentially another cost saving method, but for those with unlimited scrap, the Rambo strat would definitely make this easier. Health is the only thing that can't be bought for this fight, and running around without strategy seems to get you killed or something, so I mostly wound up hanging behind this column as it offers decent protection, while sometimes kiting adds to grip them up and reduce the number of bombs I needed. The next area I got was the Expanding Glade, and this is the last area I'll talk about the Overworld on. This is because I wasn't able to sneak past the enemies here, so there's one other strat I adopted for the Overworld. Run forward until a group of enemies are following you, and then throw a single consumable. This should spread the status and make quick work of them, freeing you up to run towards the next crystal. As always, if saving scrap isn't a concern, you could totally just chuck bombs, but this combined with just triggering the next crystal and respawning saved me at least a thousand scrap in this single overworld area alone. As for any other overworld section in this run, I always tried to sneak it first, and if it didn't work, I resorted to this strategy. The end of the glade is a fight with Shrewd, and this fight's pretty fair. While Shrewd was on his platforms, I'd toss one bomb to set statuses, and then duck behind the tree to prevent taking damage. I didn't use Black Tire on the Nexus, but on most bosses like Shrewd it's particularly good, as it gives 3 burn stacks instead of 2, making the dot really good. This makes the fight with Shrewd go a lot faster, and personally I felt that that time trade-off was worth the money. The only other notable part about using consumables is that when he drops the pod enemies you can't break the pods directly with bombs. That said, when they do spawn, the status spread makes pretty quick work of them. 
All in all, Shrewd cost me 3,250 scrap to take down. Legion was the next boss I hit, and luckily the statuses seem to do particularly well versus him. The real money drainer in this fight is the adds. For some reason, I seem to have issues getting the statuses to spread between them, and it only works sometimes in this fight. But besides needing to throw some extra bombs, I'd say that keeping statuses on the boss made him easier than normal, since you can hide while his health whittles down. Legion is a bit more costly than Shrewd was, requiring 500 more scrap. With both required bosses down, it was time to play the Water Harp and put a price on the Ravager's head. I decided to do the standard fight, where you side with the Red Doe, but I don't think it really matters. World bosses have a lot more health, so I decided to up my spending to cut down the time of this fight. Effectively, that means chucking pipe bombs and black tar anytime I can. However, there's one side effect of throwing these I've not talked about. While you're aiming a consumable and during the throw, your stamina doesn't regenerate. This means if you're aiming a lot in between boss attacks, you're likely to run out of stamina and get punished. For Ravager, he gives a short break whenever a backflip kicks away, and this time is the moment for free damage. Black Tar is also quite important in this fight to keep the burning status going as long as possible, as well as for the adds. The little rollers he spawns can't survive the explosion from a pipe bomb, meaning they won't spread the status if you hit them, so Black Tar on them it is. Besides that, this boss fight is pretty fair if you know the dodges. The only notable strategy I had was to circle around the arena as wide as possible for most of the fight. By doing so, the center columns would be left up, and these helped a lot with dodging attacks in the second half of the fight. This boss wasn't cheap, and sent me back a whopping 13,000 scrap. The labyrinth drags us in, and luckily the doors can be opened with bombs. Bleed doesn't work on the enemies in this section, and despite burn working, it doesn't deal as much damage since they resist it. So I generally opted for using the shielded heart to help run past stuff while thinking to save a few bits of scrap. Bastion isn't technically a boss, he's an aberrant, but I had to fight him. He happened to have Cloner, which is absolutely hilarious with this setup and no weapons equipped. Since they dupe your equipment, the clone has to resort to Fist. This makes him easy to dodge, despite dealing a bit more damage than I expected. There's a simple cheese for this fight, which is dropping down here and then spamming bombs. Bastion literally just stops if you land here, meaning this fight cost me only 1,250 scrap. Quite cheap. The only actual boss in the labyrinth is the Sentinel, and while it might seem straightforward since you can explode the points with bombs, there's a couple of issues. The floating cubes are a huge pain to hit, and you have to arc your throws really high to hit most of the floating ones. The most egregious one is actually by the entry door, and I couldn't hit it directly. Instead, I wound up bouncing the pipe bomb off the wall and into it. The other thing that sucks is the lack of stamina regen. It's not good to take risks with stamina here, so I played this fight a lot less aggressively than I normally do. Due to missing pipe bombs and statuses not spreading, this fight took me almost 10,000 scrap worth of pipe bombs. With Sentinel down, I rolled into a new world and got Nerud. The first boss I rolled was Abomination, and while he's not that special, there are a couple of notable things. This arena has water in it, even if it's not very deep. Since water clears the burning status, we can't keep it up for the whole fight, and this reduces our damage output, making this fight a lot harder than it otherwise would be. Additionally, until his armor plating is removed, it's possible for the pipe bombs to bounce off of it and miss him entirely due to this. I also found stamina consumption was a bit harder to manage in this fight than the others, so to offset it I just threw bombs a bit less frequently and set up shields anytime I thought I might get hit. When the first half of the health bar goes down, he starts adding some small adds, and these allow us to spread three bleeding stacks onto the Abomination, which I haven't seen happen in any other fight. This helps a lot when mitigating the elemental resist and fire being frequently removed. His armor also gets knocked off around this point, and the fight actually becomes easier in the second half for consumables. That said, this one was quite costly, stealing a total of 12,000 scrap from my wallet. Boss number two was the Custodian's Eye, and this one gave me some issues. Hitting the adds were hard, the stadium moving interrupted my throws, stamina consumption was a pain, and it just wasn't taking good damage from the bombs. The flying adds plus the laser proved to be a particularly painful combo to deal with, and for some reason the statuses didn't spread between the adds like in other fights. I knew I was going to need black tar to stack three fires to reduce the length of this fight, so I started tossing them a bit more frequently. And this is where I discovered something interesting. One black tar hit his eye, and then the laser just didn't hit me for some reason. 
As it turns out, black tar leaves a surface, and you can see this if you toss it on the ground. But if it hits an enemy in midair, it seems to leave the surface midair. If the enemy hit with black tar is already on fire, the black tar can catch fire and become a fire surface. This black tar surface just happens to collide with the laser and prevents it from going through. It took a little getting used to, but with some decent aim, I was able to prevent a lot of his laser attacks. Though, if he is moving a lot or you're having trouble getting the adds in the fire, there's two more consumables left in our arsenal. The binding orb can be paired with black tar to pull the adds in and burn them easier, and it seems to activate if you throw it at the main boss too. However, if the adds still make it through, the Brightstone AoE allows you to hit multiple and sets them on fire thanks to our equipment setup. There are two more things I'd like to point out. The first being that if he's shooting the laser into the black tar, you're free to spam pipe bombs, and I highly suggest going for a big spender approach to this fight. The second is when columns raise out of the stage. It's actually possible to throw from behind these while completely being protected. After figuring out some decent strats, my confidence in my build was restored, and the custodian's eye went down for a total cost of 19,500 scrap. A bit pricey, but a price worth paying. For world boss, I rolled Shahala and decided to do the standard fight since I used the override pin in my last run. Pipe bombs can hit Shahala and the hands directly, so there's not too much special here. There's no need to completely spam bombs anytime possible, but it is very helpful to set up statuses on the arms that raise up from the ground, as well as the main boss. Black Tar is pretty good here, but it's very easy to get hit by it, so I'd use it sparingly. The green orbs that move towards you you'd normally shoot, but they're really hard to hit with bombs, and losing stamina to do so is generally not worth it compared to just dodging. My recommended strat is to move towards one side of the map at walking speed, and then dodge the lasers when they shoot. As long as you kite them in a way that they're spaced out from you, this attack should be pretty trivial despite not being able to deal with it like normal. For a world boss, he's surprisingly cheap to take down, only requiring 12,000 scrap. Losum is the last of the main worlds, and the enemies were overall pretty easy to deal with. I got lucky it only had one required boss, which was Gwyndle the Unburnt. Interestingly enough, despite being called Unburnt, she in fact can catch fire and be burnt. I was quite used to aiming with consumables at this point, but I imagine if this was the first boss on the run, hitting her might be fairly difficult. 3,000 scrap spent, and another boss down. With there being nothing else eventful, I made it to the world boss and decided to fight Feyrin for no particular reason. The statuses go really hard against Feyrin, and he's a fairly easy to hit target most of the time as he's fairly still between attacks. The orbs he summons aren't too difficult, but since he tends to be close by him, killing them can refresh the statuses on Feyrin, or set them if he didn't have any active. The status also spreads from orb to orb, making the moments where he spawns a lot fairly easy to take down at one or two bombs. While the bulk of the fight mostly only requires this knowledge, I opted to use Brightstones quite a bit. If he has orbs on his shoulder or they're spaced a bit apart, Brightstone has a large explosion radius and makes hitting all targets a lot easier. While it doesn't inflict bleed, the burn is still more than enough to crush them. When he gets to low health, he starts doing the sword charge attack. Dodging it is easy enough, but he disappears after, and in the last bit of his health bar, this is one of our only damage opportunities. Since it takes time to pull out a consumable and throw it, this means you need to ready a bomb right after you dodge in order to hit him in time. Overall, this was a difficult but very fair fight, costing me just over 8,000 scrap, making him the cheapest world boss so far. All three worlds down, and it only took me around 8 hours of campaign time with this build to clear to Root Earth. Root Earth features tougher enemies, but the status damage from this build still made really quick work of them. I died once in the train fight, but won on my second try after realizing that Brightstone was quite good here since it did slow a lot of the enemies. Cancer is the first boss, and once again stamina management is an issue. Since pipe bombs bounced around a lot, I messed around with Brightstone on him, and while it did seem to apply the effect, I don't think the slow was actually doing anything. The branches spawning everywhere kept trapping me, and the bombs would bounce off of them which was even worse. Regardless of main effect, I actually did opt for Brightstone here to clear out larger swaths of branches due to its AoE being larger than pipe bombs. Bouncing was still an issue, but I found if you aim towards the ground where the branches are coming from, the bombs seem to trigger a lot easier. The rest of this fight comes down to keeping fire on him as much as possible, since it's probably the best damage source in this fight. That all said, he's not particularly that costly of a boss, only stealing 7,750 from my scrap hoard. 
On the way to the next boss, there's a grey door in Corrupted Harbor with standard ads. While there isn't much notable here, I did want to point out that pipe bombs are actually too strong here and one-shot most ads due to the detonation trigger. Since this means statuses aren't spreading around, I found it significantly easier to rely on Black Tar and Brightstone to keep the statuses spreading. Venom is the last guardian before the final boss, and while his attack patterns are difficult, I'm quite used to sparring with him. The statuses do particularly good damage, and besides relying on Shielded Heart and keeping statuses up, there's really not much to say about this fight. In fact, statuses were doing so good with damage, I actually beat him on my first try due to the status killing him after I died. And then the game crashed, so it didn't save my progress. So I tried him again, and beat him again without a retry just to prove how good this build is versus him. With only one boss left, there's no need for saving scrap, so we're taking a rich man's approach to annihilation. Since it does take a while to ready and toss a bomb, hitting him in the middle of attacks isn't really feasible, so in between attacks is gonna be our openings. The one opening you'd usually avoid would be when he hovers, as he dodges if you're aiming at him. However, the devs didn't seem to account for aiming consumables at him, and he doesn't dodge them, so that means throws here are practically free and a great damage opportunity. That said, hitting him at a distance can be difficult since the bombs arc, and they do need to be aimed fairly high up. This one took some getting used to as I almost always found I was aiming too low. While most attacks can be dodged easily, the orb attack is a bit of a pain since we can't freely shoot them. These are usually separated into a group of two and a group of four. Since our explosion radius is pretty decent, my strat was to toss a bomb at the group of four since it could snag all of them in one bomb, and then dodge the remaining two. If hitting them is too difficult, shielding up is an option, but I felt it better to save relics for emergencies. The orbs in phase 2 are even worse due to how many of them there are and the spacing. In order to hit all of them, I needed to bounce my bombs off the ground and target specific orbs to take them all out in time. I also couldn't take them down before getting warp once, which meant any miss would almost certainly prevent me from clearing them in time. Dealing damage in phase 2 is about the same as the first phase, just hit the windows between attacks. The damage over time persists when he shifts phases, so as long as burn and bleed are staying up, the damage output should be quite decent. While I did opt for a big spender strat here and chuck bombs as much as possible, the one exception to always be throwing is that if your stamina is low, it's probably worth it to recharge before tossing more, since he attacks fairly quickly. I actually found that fighting Annihilation with bombs was really enjoyable and had a lot of fun with this build. To no one's surprise, he cost the most of any boss, taking 24.5k worth of consumables. Honestly, this build was a bunch of fun to run, and if I didn't need to farm for a scrap, I'd probably run it on a normal basis. Most of the consumables turned out to be more useful than expected, except the Binding Orb. While I used it for Custodian's Eye, honestly I don't really feel like I'd be missing much if it just wasn't in the game. If anyone knows how to make these things even more useful, I'd be really interested, as I'd love to push this build even further. So drop a comment if you've got ideas or a solution. Pipe Bombs and Black Tar are certainly the best out of all four, and what I'd stock up on the most if you want to run a consumable build. Thanks for watching! If you enjoyed, why not drop a like or click subscribe, as I've got more upcoming challenge content that I think you'll be interested in. I'm Glitch the Box Links, and I hope to see you in the next Out of the Box Challenge.